Well, I'd like to welcome you to lecture four of Environmental Science 1401. And this will be covering chapter seven of your book. And we'll be looking at probably one of our most valuable resources, which is um, water. So basically, we're going to be looking at where does our water come from? And then what type of water are we looking for? We see that fresh water is being one of the most valuable water th uh, resources that we have and yet there's so little of it available to us. And then we're gonna look at what we do to it and how we affect our water quality. Guys, the availability and quality of water is such an important thing that the Environmental Protection Agency and the United Nations has done survey after survey to find out that, that overall people are, are interested in our water quality and also very concerned about the availability of water. Plus, the United Nations has made the availability to fresh water, and that means water that's you able to drink and cook with without getting sick, what we sometimes call potable water, as a human right. So when we think about water usage, particularly in a country like ours, we are using on average about 80 to 100 gallons a day. And that doesn't mean you're drinking it. It means just to keep you alive and to run the lifestyles that you have. And we also have to understand, too, that it, millions of people in this earth die every day due to inadequate access to water or they're drinking water that is contaminated to the point that it's killing them either slowly over time or immediately, particularly in young children. So not all of the water that we use is visible to us. I mean, drinking water, cooking water is obviously visible to us and some of the household uses like toilets, whatever. But we have this concept called embedded water. And this accounts for most of the water that you use. That means water that is involved in things you don't see, like the production of uh, crops and animals and agriculture, also the running of industrial machinery, your cars, you know, um, cooling systems and things like that. You know, so we are really not aware of how we use water, particularly in highly developed nations that separate industrial areas from where we live. Now, I like this diagram a lot because it just focuses on, on agriculture, which we're going to find out is the primary water use that we have globally. But it's looking at the embedded use of um, water in the production of certain things that we use. And this kind of bothers me because when I look at Coffee, I'm not so much a chocolate fan, but coffee uses incredible amount of water compared to everything else that we grow. And that, and I, I mean, this is in its production. You know, I mean, it is kind of like a tropical water intensive plant, but that, so every time I have a cup of coffee, I'm like, darn, I'm wasting a lot of water. And maybe I should kick the habit. But then I wouldn't be awake to do things like this video. We look at beef. That's another one that I have a beef about. Now, this is what's most disturbing about when we look at water availability and where do we get our water. When we look at the earth itself, okay, um, most of the earth's water, it means like, you know, my gosh, 90%, 80-90% of the available water is unusable to us. It's in the form of oceans. And it's really neat if you fly high enough in altitude over the earth, you can see the relative proportion of ocean to land. And it's really amazing, but yet this water is unavailable. Only a slight sliver of water on the earth is fresh water. That means water that we can directly drink, use in agriculture and run in machinery and didn't have to purify the salts out of. Now of this fresh water, most of it is frozen about 70%. And that's amazing. So this tiny sliver of water we have available to us, depending on where you live, is fresh water. And then we have 
a lot of it is frozen, again, depending on where you live. Like in Samoa, I mean, they have a tiny sliver of fresh water, and most of that fresh water, luckily, is groundwater because there is no ice there. But guys, for us, a lot of our available water is stored in ice, and you don't want to access this water. I mean, you don't want to make access to this water. It's very expensive. I know growing up in New York City, I heard stories about ships that would go out and drag back glaciers and icebergs and stuff and haul them into Long Island Sound, which is a cooler body of water near New York, and they would chop it up and sell it as ice for use in refrigeration and other purposes. So, so, and if all of this water was to melt and become available and end up going into oceans, becoming salty and flooding us anyway. Then there's this water called groundwater, which is a tiny percentage, again, of fresh water. And this is water that's found in soil and places called aquifers, where we have to put a well to get it out or drill it out or pump it out. And then there's what's called surface water. And this is water that is like rivers, lakes and streams and ponds, which again is not very available and very localized. And on the bottom is something called hygroscopic soil water. That means to get this water, you have to cook the soil and heat it to get that water out. So another way to view our soil availability is again to look at the oceans about 90 something percent. And again, this depends on regionally as far as water availability goes, where you are. And then you have your fresh water, and then there's other salt water. Don't worry about that. That's we'll learn about things called estuaries and whatever and hypersaline areas. So we take the fresh water and look at it. Most of it's in ice caps and what we call permafrost. And that means basically soil that has a body of water within it that is frozen solid most of the year. You see this in Alaska, Canada, Russia, Russia and Northern Asia, and even in Antarctica. Okay, if you want to go south, you can see it in southern parts of Argentina and whatever. And then there's our groundwater, which we do have availability, but it's a tiny sliver. And then of the groundwater, you know, again, very little of it is available to us, okay, without having to do some work to get it out of the ground. Now, when humans store water, our water reserves are called reservoirs. And we could use natural reservoirs like aquifers, which contain water, or we build artificial ones with dams. And that means we have to back up a body of water or dig a darn trench and collect rainwater. And reservoirs are a big battle because not all areas could accumulate reservoirs depending on rainfall or on water patterns. So some areas rely on another region's reservoir. And we're in a big battle with Mexico for the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo River on collecting water out of that to store for later use when the water flow is down in that river. Now, water makes up a region called the hydrosphere. The Earth has a biosphere where living creatures live. We have an atmosphere which contains our air that will be covered next lecture. And the hydrosphere is where we find water in this thing called the water cycle. And the time a, a molecule of water sits in its water cycle or, or its place in the hydrosphere is probably about 10 days. I mean, this is kind of weird, but it varies. Some water can sit for thousands of years, but the average is a molecule of water is constantly traveling, constantly traveling and going from place to place. So in this class, we're going to focus on the water that's most available to us. Of course, it's fresh water and also is the cheapest for us to get because in many areas, we just can't afford to have the quality of water and the availability of the water in the abundance that we want. So most of our water in the water cycle for us comes from precipitation. That means snow and rain and ice, if you want to separate that separately, like hail, comes down from the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is a big reservoir in itself. That means if the atmosphere dries up, we are in bad shape. Now, most of this precipitation falls on the oceans where we can't get to it. So it becomes useless because that rainwater becomes salty as it gets into the ocean. So we're relying on rain and snow and ice that lands on the soil or lands in bodies of water like rivers and lakes. And that water stays fresh. Some of that rainwater seeps into the ground to become what's part of the soil water or the groundwater. And it forms a water table, which means water just sits in the soil. I mean, literally it wets the soil and we can make a well out of that or it goes into 
underground containers called aquifers, which are basically rocks. So the water is not really liquid. It's inside of rocks, holes in rocks that we call porous rock, where it sits there, either, uh, usually flowing from one place to another. And aquifer water can sit for tens of thousands to a million years underneath the ground, unless we use it all up. So we have to have rain literally over land or over our freshwater supplies to have what's called a recharge. That means when we take out water, something has to put it back. And that major source is going to be precipitation, whether it's immediate or in the form of melting snow or ice. Now, most of my work for the past 20 years has been not so much looking at availability of water as much as water quality. But when we look at the idea of what's called water stress, that's going to be a very important focus for us to pay on because we're trying to eliminate water stress equally throughout the world so that people have a right to safe water. That means water that won't kill them immediately or won't make them sick, you know, to a certain point. And they have it to the point where they need to survive and meet basic needs and have that water at the right time that they need it. So we can look at what's called water stress. And water stress can be due to uh, a lack of availability, that means my availability is low, or it could be due to the big P word, meaning the water is polluted, either with industrial contaminants, our own solid waste, or with sewage. So when we look at, and I have trouble with colors a lot because of uh, color vision defect, um, this reddish to whatever purplish area, these are areas where water is either not available in abundance or if it is available, it's filthy. And you notice that's also true of other regions. So each little region has its own specifics. Now notice in the United States, we're safe. A lot of Russia is safe and parts of Europe are safe and not other parts of Europe, but whatever. And much of South America and Australia is safe. But it doesn't mean they're hundred percent safe. It means they do have some issues. But again, it varies with where people get their water and how industrialized they are and how they manage sewage and waste. So hopefully sometime in your education, you learned about this thing called the water or the hydrologic cycle. And you're gonna see a short video on this, but please read this in your book. And basically the water cycle just means if you were a molecule of water and I was kind of following you around, where do you start? Where do you go as a piece of precipitation? It means either water, ice, or snow, and where do you end up? Do you end up in land? Do you end up on an ocean? But basically it traces you to wherever you go in whatever organism, do you end up going in a tree, whatever, a squirrel, and how do you get back to becoming precipitation again to start your life over again? Or do you get trapped in an aquifer for a million years or an ice sheet for tens of thousands of years? So this is called the water cycle. And the problem with the water cycle is when we use water, we have to pay attention to what's called the, lo the local hydrologic cycle in our region. That means when we pull water out of something, we better damn well put it back in the same place to make sure that the recharge is appropriate for the area. That means that that water goes back the way it would have gotten there. Again, here's another view of our water cycle. So a lot of precipitation does not end up going to us, okay? And this is showing that trees and us and what soil and even the ocean and rivers and do give up, do evaporate water. So it's called evapotranspiration or sometimes evaporation. And that does make clouds that rain back on us or other areas. The precipitation on land is where we really get much of our fresh water to recharge lakes and rivers and also go into um, uh, what we call uh, groundwater of various types. So again, pay attention to the hydrologic cycle and be aware of how you dispose of water, where our wastewater goes and where does our water supply come in? Do, and where, you know, does it come from an aquifer? Does it come from a well, what's called a shallow well that gets water out of the soil? Okay, uh, what's called the water table? Or do you collect rainwater like in some areas when I was in Asia and Central America and South America? So one very common source of water, fresh water for us, for either resources or water directly, are usually going to be lakes and not so much ponds. And the difference between a lake and a pond is kind of weird. It just has to do with basically the, the size of the water, 
body and you know its volume and a whole bunch of other measures. But these are also called lentic systems, which, and don't worry about the term, it just means shaped like a lens, because the body of the water sometimes looks like that, like a lens. But anyway, this is a type of surface water. That means it's found on the surface, you don't have to drill for it. And I've lived in areas of Illinois where we used, you know, you could use lake water or you could use other bodies of, salt, of uh, fresh water, but we use lake water in certain areas as our drinking water supply, and usually that water was pre-treated so that it met drinking standards. Lakes are regularly filled by either rivers or in cold areas, glaciers or ice caps melting, and it could be recharged by precipitation from other areas. It's very important to know that lakes and ponds, lentic systems do have a structure, which I'd like you to know. They have a shoreline, where plants grow, and actually plants help add nutrients to that water. And then there's something called the littoral zone, which means an area near the shoreline. And this area is called the benthic, or the soil zone, the bottom is sometimes called. And this is the area most abundant of life, where we find most of the organisms living, and unfortunately where we put a lot of our pollution. Then there's the pelagic, or what's called the open zone, which this is usually a bypass area for many organisms going from shoreline to shoreline. And then we have a deeper area, okay, which usually there's very little, if any, sunlight sometimes. And when there's sunlight in a body of water, because you could measure this, it's called the photic or, or euphotic zone, and then something called the aphotic zone. Now, why do you care about sunlight entering water? Because sunlight feeds little creatures called algae, which provide all the food. They're the producers for these uh, lake and pond ecosystems. They also produce oxygen that the organisms need to breathe on the water in that environment. So pay attention to the layers, because we're going to come back to this a little later when we talk about particularly water pollution and the impacts of water pollution going into littoral or into pelagic or deeper areas. Now, flowing bodies of water, we sometimes call rivers, streams, or tributaries, the general term allotic systems. And uh, what's neat about these systems is the water is not stagnant, so it's usually fresh, unless it's polluted, but it's usually moving all the time, which is difficult on the organisms that live in here because they're trying to find a place to live, and they're constantly moving around and sometimes having to swim back up. Um, I used to do research on this when I was doing graduate work in Colorado on these lotic systems. And I'd work with rivers that would glacial water melt that would sometimes flow at about 15 to 20 miles an hour. And we'd have to step in the water and collect benthic creatures. And these creatures, which were usually uh, some type of insect or tiny fish, would cling and hide in the rocks to keep from being washed away. And I mean, and it was so, the water flowed so fast. I had to wear this, these chest waders that at the tie myself to a tree and wear cleats to keep from being washed down and killed, you know, and drowning and whatever was downstream from that water. So a lot of us make use of river water to drink from. And I did live in a different part of Illinois once that we used river water. And that river water would sometimes get contaminated. What was nice is the contaminants did sometimes wash away, but we still have to pay attention to that. And we have to be careful of when we put the water back in, the recharge water, that it was clean enough not contaminate people downstream from us. And some of you that live along the Trinity River and Sand Jack, you were using the water in that river. Now, some other ways to classify water besides flowing and not flowing in ocean versus fresh water is by calling, looking at these areas called wetlands and estuaries. And these are kind of temporary bodies of water that either have water in them or they're dry for certain periods of time, to have to have a certain drying period, or they have a balance of salt and fresh water. So a wetland in general has actually a legal definition of an area where water sits for a certain period of time. And then it could dry up and come back again. And there's certain air, uh, organisms that thrive in this. I mean, that they just thrive in it. They're able to survive the dry periods, which is amazing. Even certain types of fish that their eggs can dry up the, the adults die, and then when the water comes back, the eggs hatch scripturally into adults, and they only live for that wet period. Isn't that kind of cool? At least the adults do. And then there's regions called estuaries. These are usually areas where bodies of flowing water 
meet oceans. And they're very unique areas that vary between wet, I mean, uh, salty and, and freshwater areas. So understand, read about this in your book, because again, these are very interesting bodies of water. And it's funny because wetlands and estuaries are areas where we get a lot of our food supply, particularly estuaries are one of the major source of, of, of uh, resources for fish, sea life, and even land life around the world. And the and estuaries are very, very protected and also very subject to being polluted by humans. Now, probably one of our next to the easiest areas of water to access is from groundwater, which contains water table water. That means water that's in the soil. That's right about here. It sits in the soil, okay, above any rock, okay. And that just comes from rain. But the problem with that is you have to pump it out of the ground and you do have to clean it because it's been sitting in soil. And that means you can't dump pollution or other things in the soil. And then they're called aquifers. And this shows two layers of aquifers, one on top of the other. It's not unusual. We find that in our area a lot when you head west or go north. For us, we sit on what's called the Gulf Coast Aquifer, which is really only one aquifer sitting sh uh, shallow in the soil. Uh, aquifers, they are basically rock that does not leak or it leaks slowly, but it does usually have what's called a recharge area somewhere, either nearby or far away, that rainwater slowly ropes in. And some of these aquifers do have open gaps that you could actually take a boat in, or they form caves sometimes, but most of the time the water is in rock, very much like a sponge. So this water gets into the aquifers and it can take anywhere from years to a million years to flow from point A to point B. And it's a great storage area. You can put a pipe in it and that water will actually pump itself out as an artesian well. And sometimes these wells form as cracks in the ground and they form little freshwater areas. They tend to be very cold that you can drink that water without even having to purify it. And sometimes they actually pour out of cracks out of the rock. And like I've seen this in, uh, in Austin area a lot when kayaking along, um, you know, near the uh, aquifer areas. Okay, you also see it around uh, South Texas State University too. They have an aquifer just like this, a crack in the aquifer that you could actually boat on. We use aquifer water in our area. The problem with aquifers though, is when you take too much water out of them to use for uh, industrial drink and agricultural use, it's basically like squeezing a sponge. And these areas tend to shrink and produce what's called subsidence. And you could also drain them to the point of cracking the rock apart and killing the aquifer. So this is very valuable clean water. Sometimes it contains minerals and it's what we call hard water. And it does have to be filtered if you want to. And sometimes we sell it as spring mineral water. This is where you find a lot of bottled water comes from aquifers. But not all parts of the world have availability to this valuable water resource, which we have to basically conserve. This slide is, some, is showing the extent of certain aquifers, how big they can go. They can run from Nebraska all the way down to central Texas. Central West, uh, and this is amazing how big some of these are. But the thing is, we got to remember, if you're going to use water here, you better put it back here in a clean form, because if you just take it out and don't put it back, that makes it bad for everybody downstream from you. So this is called withdrawal and recharge. So we have to withdraw and recharge in a very smart manner. And we can't put too much pollution into this. And we can't dump our pollution in here because that goes into people's, you know, recharge water that comes uh, upstream. So, uh, and we have this idea of water mining in which we treat water very much like we're supposed to treat other resources. We should be careful with it and use it very prudently and also make sure that we keep enough for everybody that uses that water to have equal access to the same volume and quality. So anytime we use ground water, and this is an invisible problem because when you take river water and lake water out, you can see the water level go down but we don't see that when the water is on the ground. So when we start looking at taking from underground water, we have this term called subsidence, which I mentioned a little earlier. And that means the soil can sink 
And the problem with subsidence is you have this ground and we'll put some housing there. So that's a nice little apartment complex or you can live in your own little standalone house or whatever. So subsidence is when we're taking, we're withdrawing water from under the ground. We're pumping it up and using it. And if we don't replace that water, that, that aquifer or that water table shrinks and the soil tends to collapse or lower underneath it. And we have areas of Houston that over the past 100 years, the, the, the subsidence, the sinking of land has occurred, is sunk 20 to 50 feet in some areas. Usually it's a little more subtle, but you can tell when an area has subsided because what we see is that when there's heavy rains, those areas tend to flood when they never flooded before because water now puddles and pools in them. And this is a consequence of subsidence. Besides, sometimes the soil on the house can collapse and you actually get a sinkhole. Now, some other things occur when you draw water out of the ground. And this is even true sometimes if we drain lakes that are near an ocean. So in areas near oceans, we get a, 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 a feature called salinization or saltwater intrusion. And that means if you're near an ocean, like Houston, Galveston, of course, Corpus Christi, you're near a salty body of water. When you start sucking water out of the ground, fresh water, that is, salt water that underlies it or leaks from here into the shoreline near that littoral area or shoreline area, that salt water could actually get sucked into the fresh water and in some cases even go up and contaminate it. And I've seen this in Corpus because the salt water eventually kills plants, it kills your yard. And I've seen this in other areas where they just can't grow crops anymore because all the soil here in this area is now salty. And you can even suck salt sometimes into rivers. If there's a river nearby that flows, that salt water intrusion will affect it. Salt water intrusion is a major, major factor of water quality in many coastal areas that have dense population. So some other things that we do to water that affect the hydrologic cycle. And one thing is called impervious spaces. What we tend to do, particularly in urban areas, is we take our soil and we hide it. We take the soil that normally has trees and plants and that the rain, the precipitation and snow could actually pass through and enter the hydrologic cycle. So what we do is we basically put cement and that cement could be the foundation for a house, it could be a parking lot, it could be a sidewalk, it could be anything, whatever. We could also put a building up that takes away that land. I mean, and this becomes now what we call impervious. That means rainwater cannot pass into it. It kind of bounces off of it and then runs off into whatever pervious material is available, or permeable, we should say, material. And that can cause problems because when water runs off of here, it tends to puddle and pond and run off and it can cause flooding, localized flooding. But the thing is, is that this disrupts the water cycle and can disrupt recharge by moving recharge sometimes miles away from where the water is supposed to get in. And that could literally dry the soil underneath it and cause it to sink. And another thing we do with when we do construction is we produce sediment. That means we disrupt soil nearby bodies of water. And when we dig into soil, it causes soil, especially small particles called clay, to enter rivers and lakes and even oceans. And sediment can block the sunlight in water, which becomes very dangerous because then that reduces photosynthesis and the population of organisms that live in that area. It could also reduce the, the oxygen content in the water. And also sediment can carry nasty pollutants. And if the sediment gets in your drinking water or gets into the organisms that live in that water, it can carry contaminants into us, particularly dangerous, nasty, toxic contaminants. So some other ways we disrupt uh, surface water is by producing what are called canals or channels. And that means if you're basically transporting materials, taking a boat through here, you don't want to make all those twists and turns as only is to the mileage of the trip. Plus, what's unique about bodies of water is when they twist like that, that's called kind of like channeling or oxbowing. This part of the river here 
tends to keep pushing the soil away and that gets grows and grows and grows while this area fills in and grows and it tends to change actually the location of the river this happens to all major rivers you see like that and i lived along the mississippi river once when i was living in uh, illinois and missouri and man you would see this occur so what would happen is we try to keep, keep that from happening by basically cementing these areas to keep the water from cutting away at the soil and moving a river or we build a channel and that means we cut a straight line through here and eventually these kind of eventually dry out and then this straight line eventually does what's called the oxbowing again but that takes you know tens of thousands of years to get to an extreme point now uh, when we do channel like this we are affecting natural flows and we disrupt wildlife and i once uh, got a job as a, when i was a graduate student in environmental science um doing an environmental impact statement on a channel that was being cut through a part of the mississippi river and we had to look at the effect of dredging that means taking a a boat and some uh, bulldozers and just basically cutting this back into a straight river and i had to look at how it would impact wildlife and that study took about a year and the dredging would have taken maybe about five to six years to get it done but it's done a lot for not because we're protecting nature but protecting our use of that river now we're getting into my most favorite body of waters and that's marine ecosystems particularly oceans and guys so oceans are where most of our water is oceans are also very important because they produce most of the precipitation that comes back to our freshwater environments so it is a supplier of fresh water through precipitation but i want you to read up on oceans in the book and understand just like lakes they have regions very much like the littoral zone they have a, a shore they and there's your uh littoral zone oceans tend to be what we call tidal that means they have tides and tides have nothing to do with waves even though they're affected by waves but tides have to do with the gravitational force of the moon pulling up or releasing okay the gravitational effect on the ocean so that's kind of weird but whatever so oceans rise and fall and even large lakes sometimes uh about every six hour periods and when the water rises and make the water go up to high tide zone when it lowers it goes to what's called the low tide zone and there's your littoral zone right there which is a shallow piece of water that stays submerged then there's your littoral i mean your benthic zone which is the ground and this is what's called a euphotic zone or photic zone where light penetrates and in the oceans the light penetrates only very shallowly this is called the pelagic zone which means open ocean and it's literally like a desert you could take a submarine through the pelagic zone and not see anything fish usually use it as a bypass area or a place to hide most of the fish life occurs here but most of everything in the ocean occurs there if they're going to be there so this is probably primarily where most organisms live then the next area then these here and this the least this is called the abyss the deepest area of the ocean and this is incredible how the pressures and other factors here even water temperatures sometimes getting up to 800 degrees how extreme there are and there's still organisms the sad factor about how we use our ocean resources is we tend to use them as like toilets we put a lot of our waste into them and we tend to over harvest that means fish from areas here and here but many of our wastes get dumped here and sometimes end up here where it affects the productivity of those areas and we can sometimes see the death of those areas particularly true in estuaries which are particularly sensitive to pollution and and, fa and ocean factor fluctuations so oceans just like lake they have their own unique benthic areas unlike lakes they have what's called an abyssal area this is that deep part of a spongebob where the bus kind of takes a trip all the way down okay these again are very productive areas that we find and also again you know very delicate areas that tend to be subject to pollutant to, to repeat again when we get into what's called the littoral and shoreline areas 
when we get to high tide and low tide, these are where you find most of the aquatic wildlife, the most abundance. I used to do research in New York in one of these areas, collecting organisms, and it was amazing the diversity, even in New York City in polluted areas, along some estuaries and also some uh, more freshwater, I mean, a more uh, oceanic type of um, uh, uh, shorelines, but it was just incredible to see all the life. And you can see this even in parts of uh, Galveston and Bolivar Peninsula, where it's a little less populated. So again, these are the areas we have to protect. And this is where most of our oceans get its nutrients from here, and particularly estuaries and nearby coral reefs, which are usually right near these shorelines. So how does the ocean support life? It supports life by basically small organisms called uh, plankton, particularly phytoplankton. They live in an area called the neritic zone. Don't worry about that. But well, it's just another way to divide the ocean. They collect food and make food for larger organisms to eat. And they start the food chains. Literally, when we start looking at coral reef areas, coastal, you know, uh, warm areas in particular, they provide food for most of the oceans that organisms from thousands of miles around come in to feed here. And it's particularly true for coral reefs. Coral reefs produce food for all the world. Our coral reef off the coast of Texas and Louisiana, about 110 to about 150 miles out, literally feeds organisms from all over the world that swim in. Whales, eels, large fish, tuna, that swim from literally around the world, thousand mile trips, just to get there to feed and then they go back home. And we even have fishing boats from distant areas of humans coming in and taking advantage of that abundant wildlife. So provide, besides providing food, evaporative water, and also oxygen, we got to remember that wherever you find photosynthesis in the ocean, you find oxygen that we need to breathe. Oceans majorly affect climates and climate affects oceans. So when we learn atmosphere in the next lecture, we're going to see that the atmosphere and oceans work together to form long-term weather patterns and short-term patterns. Okay, long-term weather patterns meaning climate, short-term just meaning daily weather. Okay, so oceans make up again two-thirds of the Earth's surface and that has a major impact on climate. And what, uh, and what affects ocean temperatures are gonna be currents and sunlight hitting those oceans. So down here, more sunlight hits the ocean than up here when we start looking at more polar regions. So look at these flow patterns. Oceans are constantly swirling and flowing. And this has to do with just wind patterns, the rotation of the earth, and also what are called deep sea wells that occur and stir up the water. So look at where um, we get our water. And this is very important to pay attention to. So when we look at our own water, the Gulf of Mexico, okay, gets water that comes from, of course, the Atlantic, the, cent uh, the Southern Atlantic, and also from the equatorial region. And that's cool. That's a nice warm water. When I grew up in New York, we also had nice warm water for our beaches. If you go to California, man, because I once dove off of San Diego, never do that again, because that water comes down from Alaska and it's cold. And it actually keeps this region sometimes mild and not hot considering how far south it is. So these patterns affect fish life, it affects sea life in general, it affects the temperature of our air, and it also affects storms, how many storms we have, particularly cyclones or hurricanes. So one oceanic that's also an atmospheric effect is created by a misunderstood and often uh, uh, lied about effect called a Coriolis effect. And so it's capitalized. It's named after a person. Okay, it should be capitalized. So the Coriolis effect basically means that the earth spins. And we're going to see that that helps produce a wind that kind of goes, you know, west to east, but also causes a spin in large bodies of water, usually not ponds and definitely not toilets. Toilets don't have a water spin due to Coriolis effect. That's due to the way they designed the jets of the water to make the water swirl so it washes off all any residue you leave behind in the toilet because straight flowing water doesn't have the power to do that.
So really, you only see this on the oceans. You will not feel the effect of Coriolis on your body. That means you don't twist and turn as you're moving. A large body would. So this is only a large effect. It does have an impact on hurricanes, not always tiny storms, but on uh, particularly large tornadoes and hurricanes. So, uh, and so, so, when we, so this helps to drive and swirl water. And you can see how ocean currents tend to move in, in North America from uh, north to south and then in a westward spin and in the southern part of the world into a northern, again, westward towards movement. Then we have these things called deep currents. And these are, we're just learning about these. These deep currents come down from cold areas in the south Southern hemisphere works the opposite direction. And what these areas come do is they, it's from melting glaciers and whatever, and precipitation, and this cold water underlies, it literally flows under the water above it. And it tends to cool some of the water here and disturb the water and create swirling patterns. It also tends to take fresh water and move it into um, salt water areas. And actually it forms, if we were to look at that body of water, right here and put it up here underneath would be salt water so we're looking at it from the sides i mean uh, fresh water and on top of it would be the ocean salt water so this is fresh water from here that underlies this and and it's cold water where that's a warmer salty water and literally if you were to dive into that you can feel what's called that thermo halo cline or halen cline or the thermo halen conveyor belt so this also helps to create currents and changes in the quality of the water, the density of the water. So don't worry so much about understanding the mechanism of it to know that our oceans are constantly moving. Winds even contribute to this too. And it forms these patterns that make life livable. And actually animals do follow these water currents to migrate. We have eels that migrate from Northern Europe all the way into the Gulf of Mexico and they use that water flow to help them swim and then they uh, the babies swim back north because a lot of times the, the male the parents die sometimes the adults do swim back and follow those currents whales take advantage particularly of these deep currents that move sometimes up to 100 miles an hour it's amazing counter currents could also conduce up uh, and, and solar incidents on the oceans can also cause these periodic effects that we see in the Pacific called um, basically El Ninos and La Ninas. And this just has to do with temperature, particularly of the Pacific Ocean and how it affects the temperature of surrounding bodies of water like the Atlantic Ocean or the Indian Ocean. So what happens is we have these periodic climatic changes in which the um, Pacific Ocean in this region is unusually cool or unusually warm, or this is unusually warm or cool or whatever. And that affects wind patterns, it affects uh, ocean flow patterns that either makes hurricanes for us on this side, funny enough, or them either more abundant or not. Okay, so again, when we start looking at these, these are all the complexities of our oceans. And what's funny is global climate change can impact this more because it can cause this area to either cool or warm or stay warmer or cooler, you know, more likely because global climate change can cause cooling or warming. Overall, it causes a warming effect, which the ocean tends to absorb. So you've probably heard enough of now, where does our water come from? Now I'm going to look at where does it go? And this is probably the biggest issue because the way we withdraw and recharge water is not good because we tend to withdraw water and recharge it somewhere else. Or if we recharge it, it's in a form that we really shouldn't be putting it back in because it's ruining the quality of water that everybody else needs, you know, downstream from that recharge. So when we look at water usage, Remember, we are part of the problem. Each individual and each country has its own way of water usage. So this is now, remember, this is global. When we say global, about 80% of the world's population is to be represented by 
minimally developed or underdeveloped nations. And that's not a negative thing to say underdeveloped. It means they don't have a lot of industrialization or a high standard of living that uses a lot of resources. So, uh, you know, about 20% of the world is using most of the resources. So when we look globally, agriculture is a major user globally. And that's only because the high percentage of countries that have a large agricultural base and don't have the industry yet. And they're feeding a lot of people. So their agriculture tends to be more extensive than ours. They're, they're feeding 10 to 20 times more people than we have. Industry is about 20% globally. Now, if we look at Houston of course, or New York City, that number is going to be almost zero and that number is going to be through the roof. And that number will also be high when we look at what we call public water use. That means residential, small businesses and houses will be higher. So each area has its own unique water usage. But globally, agriculture is number one. And the problem with the way a lot of us do agriculture is it pollutes. It adds sediment to water, to the recharge, it adds fertilizer, pesticides, and other types of waste that affect what's called the biological oxygen demand. Or, and that means certain chemicals that are in the agricultural waste suck up oxygen out of the water that makes it less available to organisms. So we, and what's really sad, and I'm glad this is in the slide, is that because of our fussiness about water, a lot of us in developed countries drink bottled water. I, I don't like it unless I'm traveling. And even then I will use a reusable bottle of some type. But the bottled water industry is ridiculous. And it's really funny. Most of this water in the bottled water industry comes from tap water from another place. That means another city's water that is cleaned or it comes from aquifers that you would normally get your water from anyway. So it's kind of dumb. So we're using all this plastic that ends up as a mostly as a non-recycled waste. Plastic uses a lot of petroleum, a lot of energy, a lot of transport. It contributes to CO2 in the environment just to have the convenience of a bottle of water. And I think that's crazy. And that's where a lot of our water goes, believe it or not. Consumption water, which a lot of those bottles never make it to become even consumed. So when we start looking at urban and suburban areas, think about what you do personally with water. And this is just a general thing, but it still holds pretty true. Of course, this varies from country to country, region to region. But guys, look how much water we use in our flush toilets. And I once actually was in the woodlands once and um, a toilet bus came by. It was a big home, uh, home, uh, what is it? Home suppliers and appliance suppliers conference. And they had this thing called a toilet bus, which showed all these high-tech toilets that had anything to bidets, two digital toilets, a toilet control from your phone, self-cleaning toilets, but mostly electronic toilets. And I and they wouldn't let me sit on them because they were afraid I was going to do something, whatever. But anyway, I took a look at these toilets and I saw some energy-efficient toilets. They were incredible. They used very low flow water, one third of what a normal toilet does. It flushed very well, and it also cleaned the water too. It was just kind of cool. But look at this. Toilets, bathing, laundry, lawns are terrible in suburban areas. And then we look at washing our dishes and then, of course, drinking and cooking, which is actually a minor part. Now, this I can see right here, needing clean water. But guys, we in our country, we flush drinkable water down the toilet. Water that is cleaner than any other water in the world unless you have a special system that uses what's called gray water. Gray is in G-R-A-Y or G-R-E-Y. And that's water that's recycled usually from this use or from this use. It has a little soap in it, a little whatever. Okay. And that water can actually be used to flush toilets. You can actually bathe in it. I've done that a lot. And you can do your laundry in it. I've done that a lot. And you can definitely water your lawns in it. A lot of houses have these now. And you do this overseas a lot. <coughs> you use what's called secondary water. You can use that water also for industry, for cooling and other things. So this is wasteful. And people in other countries that have inadequate access to water or adequate, or, or they only have access to dirty water, they're disgusted that we take perfectly clean water and use it for these purposes.
a lot of uh, 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 mobile homes sometimes will recycle the water and have a reservoir just for drinking and cooking water. And then that water, once it's used, goes into, it's cleaned up a little and used for bathing water. And that's why sometimes in mobile homes you don't drink, I should say RVs, you don't drink the bathing water and the water you wash your hands in. When I was taking students with uh, one of our geology professors, Dr. Latargo, to the Philippines, we had to warn them not to drink out of the sink water and the uh, bathing water, luckily not the toilet water, but whatever. She so said that water is not meant to be drunken. So this is it. And think about, guys, when you think about your personal use of water, think about the embedded water that you use for the crops you eat, the animals you eat, if you eat animals, for the way, for the recreation you do, for your consumerism. So almost all of our water usage is determined by consumer use and your whims, how you buy, how you do this, how you do that, how many times you shower, how many, what kind of toilet you have. I'm serious. We determine our society, our wants, not our needs. Our needs mean basic things we need, but our wants, that means the luxuries, really determine water usage. Now you're going to see a separate video on water pollution because it's a big topic. And I want you to read it in your book. Now, the major thing about understanding about water pollution is that there are tens of thousands of types of pollutants. Anything from dead animals to your own poop and pee to crop waste to industrial chemicals to household chemicals, whatever. But there's two sources, what we call point solution, I mean point pollution or point sources. And that means I can literally go up to that place and point where it comes from, like a certain building or a factory or a farm. I can point to it. But then there's what's called non-point sources. And that means we don't have the capability as society. If I find a pollution here, I can go back and say it came from that house. I can't determine that. Now, I could sometimes trace back a chemical to, let's say, an office building or an industry or a certain farm. So we have what are called point and non-point. Point sources are easy to track. Non-points are not. Non-points also come from cars and boats and planes because you can't definitively point to where the pollutant came from unless you see it actually coming out of a car and whatever. And that's why we have planes that have to pass inspection, cars have to pass inspections and things like that so they're not leaking oils out or producing certain contaminants that get in the air and then end up in water because we have to see it happening at that moment. So pollutants can be sediment, that means soil, or dust. It can be chemicals, like your book says in the case of Flint, Michigan, that was lead that came out of old piping. Or it could be biological, like bacteria, poop, and even foreign organisms, invasive species. Probably equal important to water pollution is water scarcity. And we're seeing a lot more water scarcity as we're seeing severe climatic changes. Because guys, global climate change also affects how water gets into a region. And you can end up with flooding or end up with drought. And also, guys, when we start, as populations go up, people tend to draw up water quicker and don't let water, rainwater, stay in the ground as long as possible. And that causes soil and the water to get saltier. It encourages salt water to move in or when we keep taking water out as fast as it gets in, salts from the upper layer of the soil do not get to wash away, and that soil becomes salty. And you can see, like, if you ever go to um, so the salt flats in Utah area, whatever, you can see what salty soil looks like. And I've seen areas of Oklahoma where farmers were draining the water so quickly out of the soil as fast as it can get in, or they were improperly irrigating, that the soil became so salty they couldn't grow crops anymore without having to supplement and fix the soil. So water scarcity can also sometimes be due to pollution. It means I can't drink this water and that makes it less available. So how do we keep fresh water clean? I'm not gonna to totally go into it. There's various ways of doing it, but the one important way is what are called through sanitary wastewater systems. And you're gonna see a beautiful video about it because for me, the greatest marvel of environmental hydrology of environmental engineering is the creation of sewage systems. And you're gonna learn about the history of this and why it's so important because sewer systems 
uh, removing polluted water took, was concerned in ancient times, back to the Magna Carta. And even back in ancient Asia and Africa, people were trying to deal with what do we do with our wastewater. And we started using technology as a way of eventually dealing with that, starting in the early Roman days till, uh, and even actually in ancient Egypt, and then even till today where we now use machinery to deal with water quality. So pay attention to what is called sanitary wastewater systems. And you can use these on your home or cities can set these up to treat many houses. But guys, once when we deal with sewer water, that is the major killer of people. When our fresh water is recharged with sewage water or contaminated with sewage water, that is a deadly mix and killed at one time killed one in three children, even in this country. Uh, guys, modern sewer systems are very big, very expensive, and also very wasteful. And that's why we see them not being able to be used in many developed countries. When I was doing a project in Bangladesh, we had a pollutant that we could not really stop the industries because it would kill the economy. And plus, there were people dying because they were fighting the pollution. I mean, people, scientists dying, being murdered because of the necessity for this area to have these tannery industries that are producing a nasty pollutant that I was helping to study. So we were coming at ways of, we can't stop the pollution, but let's reduce it. So one of my answers was using plants called phytoremediation to remove the pollutant from the water and the soil. And then other people were looking at greener ways of making the tan, you know, tanned materials that didn't use this compound called uh, hexavalent fluorine. Um, another thing we tried doing, the government tried doing, was building a sewage treatment plant that removed the pollutant and actually you can take the pollutant and turn it into uh, industrial chemicals. They can recycle it and make money and even sometimes turn it into vitamins, believe it or not, that went into human and livestock vitamins. But the problem with the sewage treatment plant method was that the country did not have the consistent electricity or fuel to run the plant or maintain it. And they built this huge plant that never worked right. It basically was just flowing water in and flowing water out. And they couldn't afford the filters and other things to keep maintaining the system. So our goal in environmental science is to find sustainable ways to treat sewage, because that's probably our biggest problem. And, and, and probably humans, you know, waste sewage is a much bigger problem than when we look at industrial wastewater. So later on in this class, we're gonna learn about politics. And just understand that today, you have this wonderful act. That means a giant governmental policy that was set that's engraved in stone and difficult to change. A president can, can't strike it. They can cause little changes in it, but they cannot strike the overall presence of it because it takes an act of Congress. And even then Congress has to be careful about it and get public input. So you have what's called a Safe Drinking Water Act. And the United Nations has similar recommendations and other countries have similar policies in which we look at water, clean water as a right. And if you're not getting that clean water, something's wrong and we have to put government money into it. And then there's also uh, called the Clean Water Act, which is very, which is basically within the Safe Water Act. And this basically has to do with mostly clean waterways rather than water that you're drinking, but it, it preserves waterways so that we protect the environment also not just drinking water. So these are very similar overlapping, overlapping acts. But again, there's laws within them and regulations within them that can be changed. We can set the standards of what is safe. Because if you go overseas, safe means different things, different countries, different regions. And this is where we can define and modify these regulations. That's where presidents have a lot of power and governments have a lot of power. So to end this lecture, what is the problem we're having with water? If global climate change is occurring at the rate it's expected and is due to our altering the earth, we better be pretty well aware about how this is gonna change water resources. I mean, this is gonna affect areas dramatically. It's gonna cause droughts in some areas, flooding in others. It's gonna take a ton of fresh water and turn it into seawater that is not going to be available to us. So I just want you to sit back and think about the consequences because melting glaciers does not mean we're just going to lose a beautiful thing. I mean, I did some glacier climbing once in Alaska 
and the glacier I used to climb in Whittier, Alaska, it's almost not there anymore. And Glacier National Park in the United States doesn't have glaciers anymore. So yes, they're things of beauty, but they're also critical for the hydrologic cycle and for how water is recharged. So just think something to think about as we end this lecture. And please pay attention to any supplementary videos that I provide with this class.